That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. This is set after the crucifixion. Uh, The disciples are meeting behind locked doors because of fear of the Jewish leaders. We live in a contested world. We live in a world where Jesus has died and risen and stands in great love. Nothing can separate us from his love. And he is always acting and moving for the benefit of his people and for all people, in fact. Jesus has demonstrated his great love for us in this. So he died for us. And he's been raised to that point of the right hand of the Father. He, like, he stands in glory. He is the, the king of love who's for you. He's for you. He loves you and he is for you. And, and in the middle of that, the, uh, as he says in John 10.10, 10, uh, the devil acts to steal and to kill and destroy. And so we have a contested space in which uh, we live. And uh, if we look on a couple of slides, you'll see uh, that this is a way of illustrating the contested space in which we live. Uh, the, the worldview of the Bible was that the, the world was dark red before Jesus came. There was a call and a cry that God would act, but the reality of the world was called a present evil age. And the reason it was, was not because everything was bad, or everyone was bad, but because there were powers who had authority which caused them to twist and corrupt not only people's hearts, but the whole of creation. And uh, it was like living in exile, like living away from everything God wanted to bring on the people. And Jesus comes and he says, I will reign in you by my spirit. I will offer you life, life to the full. I've come that you can have life and life to the full. And so he comes into this dark red world, uh, but he doesn't bring in this instance all that is to come in the future, the future glorious reign that is gold, glorious gold, and the defeat of all evil and everything that's wrong with the world will be totally removed is something that's still to come. And we live in this grubby orange space in the middle here where you have these two kings and these two kingdoms who are fighting against each other. The king of this earth, as Paul calls him, the enemy, Satan, the principalities and powers, and King Jesus. And Jesus and the These two kingdoms are are fighting against each other and both existing in this same space. Now, we know who's going to win, but the reality of this time is that the battle is occurring and is continuing. And so you have the, the, the work of evil that's seeking to steal, kill, and destroy, and the work of Jesus through his church that's seeking uh, to bring life to the full. And so when you, uh, Look at the reality of there being an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. When the disciples saw that, Jesus was with them and he was killed. The instinct of humans is to retreat behind closed doors. You find a door and you lock it and you shut this big, dark, dangerous, and hostile world out. And they sh- that's what they did. It wasn't uh, just in case uh, you, you misunderstand it, this translation that we had was the Jewish leaders. In some passages it says the Jews. You know, this is John who is a Jewish man who followed a, a Jewish Messiah. All his friends were Jewish. Uh, there's no sense of anti-Semitism in the Bible. It's people talking about just what's a phrase they can use to talk about, oh, this is the guys who didn't believe in Jesus. The ones who killed him, the Jewish leaders, is a very helpful translation. And, uh, and so what we find is that the instinct of these disciples, despite having been with Jesus for three years, having been called by him, having seen amazing miracles, is when they see the reality of the work of evil and hostility against God in the world, they retreat and lock the door. And when you look at the reality of this last week, 
you know, you, you see the horror of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and not just the reality of the earthquake, but the way that uh, governments and authorities have, have responded, and the way that um, the, there is just the, the awfulness, just the utter awfulness of the numbers. And, uh, you know, personally this last week, uh, the, uh, you may have seen on the news, but my dad for 40 years taught a school called Epsom College, which this last week the, the head teacher, who was the previous head at Croydon High, who you may know, was shot by her husband and her daughter was shot in a house that, that I've been into many times. And it's just the awfulness, like there's, there's just the utter destructive nature of that. And you hear these things and you think, I don't know what to do with this. It, you can't find the emotions to feel about those things. And so what is so natural in the instinct is you lock the door and you, 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 you push it away. That's the human instinct in this contested space. And, and if we just go on to the next slide, this is what was happening with the disciples. Now, fear locks the doors on Jesus' people. And the desire that Jesus would have for you and for me, the thing he wants to awaken us to is that we are the ones who bring glorious gold into this contested world. We are the ones. He has given the task of so the love of Jesus Christ, so hope into this contested space. But when fear comes in, as it did to the disciples, uh, the life that is God's wanting to disciples to live, he wants them to get out there and preach the word. He wants them to get out and be filled with the Spirit and go and change the world. But they're, they're behind closed doors due to fear. And what you find over and over again is that fear becomes a block on what Jesus wants to use you for. He wants to use you and I to sow life and gold into this space in which we live. But often, fear prevents it. And so we remain in a space that is more dark red than it needs to be. We can, if we're not careful, become a fear-led church. People who are led by fear. And if that happens... And all you've got in this current contested space is a church that's defined by fear. The world remains broadly as it is. Broadly as it is. Now what does Jesus do about this? Uh, next slide. Jesus came and stood among them. Suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. What Jesus never does is say, hey, go and do better. Hey, don't be led by fear. Go and sort yourselves out. Try harder. No. Jesus gifts his presence to people who are struggling and locking doors because of fear. Jesus gifts his presence. Now, the thing that's really important about this is the doors are locked, but Jesus comes in anyway. He miraculously breaks into a space where he shouldn't be able to get into. Because it's a gift. It's his grace. It's the miracle of his love. You might be feeling quite fearful. You might be feeling like, I don't know how to respond. There is no need for you to be in a good place before Jesus approaches you. You don't have to have faith. You don't have to start doing well before Jesus comes to you. He comes through the locked doors. He meets you in your space of fear. He meets you in miraculously. It's just purely his grace and a gift. He comes to you in that space where he shouldn't be. But he comes. He comes to meet you in that space. And Jesus is very pastoral towards you. Do you, do you see what he does? Look at, look at my hands. Look at my side. He, he doesn't come and say, you naughty disciples, you know, you knew what I told you to do. What are you doing here behind the closed doors? He comes and he says, look, I can, I can understand how you're feeling. So look, here I am. He's very pastoral to you, Jesus. Do you know that? When Jesus comes to you, he doesn't give you a list of things you should have been doing. He comes and says, look, let me meet you where you are. Let me recognize your fear. Let me, let me, let me show you that I myself have suffered. I myself understand this place you're in. And I've conquered it. 
and I've conquered it. Jesus is the only one who's strong enough and loving enough to defeat Satan's work against us. Jesus is. He's already defeated Satan on the cross. That's just the fundamental truth of what Jesus does on the cross. He, de- he disarms the principalities and powers. He defeats Satan and he breaks fear in his love. And so uh, it's a bit like, I don't know if you've ever played top trumps with a child. Have you ever played top trumps with a child? And you know that the, there's normally a top trump that is probably going to win against any other card. And uh, if you've ever played with a kid, you know, you can tell when they've got the top trump card at the top, because they, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter whose go it is, they'll be, you know, they kind of know this one's mine, right? You know, they, and, and what Jesus does is he comes and says, whatever the devil has done to seek to steal, kill, and destroy, whatever he's doing right now, Whatever you're fearful of, here's a top trump that's going to beat it. King Jesus died on the cross. He took the worst, the worst that the devil could throw at him. And he chewed it up and he spat it out and he came back alive. And he was raised to greater glory than he ever had before the enemy came against him. He is the top trump that nobody can ever defeat. He comes in love. But what Jesus comes in gifts to you is his self, his presence. Now, let me just be a pastor for a minute. When you are in trouble and going through a hard time, or if you know somebody in trouble and going through a hard time, The answer is not, I believe that God's going to heal this. It's not faith. The answer is not, I believe that God's going to sort this for you. That's not the answer. The answer is Jesus. Do you understand the difference? We don't say to somebody, I believe I have enough faith. Have faith that God's going to sort this out. No, we say, Jesus wants to meet you where you are right now. The presence of Jesus is the gift. It's the top trump. It's not your faith. It's not my faith. It's not a Bible verse. It's not this, that, and the other. It's Jesus. All that people need in the midst of challenge when they're behind the locked doors is Jesus himself to appear behind the door and say, look at my hands, look at my side. And so when you're in trouble, what you do is you, you, I mean, by all means read the Bible, by all means pray, by all means, but what you need is you need Jesus. Jesus is what you need. And Jesus doesn't say you have to be anything or do anything or say anything or pretend anything. You just are with Jesus. And with Jesus there, it becomes okay. It becomes more than okay. You become more than a conqueror. And so when we minister and speak to people who are struggling in a bad place, what we say to them is, Jesus, I'm praying for Jesus to be with you, for you to see Jesus, for you to have Jesus approach you. That's what we do. Does that make sense? You may or may not know, but this last, last Sunday, actually, our, our eldest son, Jared, was playing rugby. And uh, this is going to be, I'm probably going to cry a little bit, but that's okay, because we don't mind. Uh, he got really badly injured when he was playing, and he's, um, he's effectively damaged his pancreas, which is a ma- major organ, and um, it's, it's really badly damaged, actually. So this week, we've been in hospital all week. Right, he's still there. Just stayed overnight last night and came in this morning. And um, the reality is that in that hospital room, and he, he, when he was 18 months old, was really sick as well. He had seizures and stopped breathing and all this kind of stuff. And both times, when you're in that space and you're like, I have no answers here, Jesus has been like he's come into the room. And the beauty of his presence, 
It's just, it's everything. It's everything. And the reality is that that is what we want and we need, church. That's what we need and we want. My prayer for you is that you have Jesus come into your space. And sometimes the circumstances don't change. And sometimes they do. But when Jesus comes, the dark red reality of this world, you can begin to come. And the glorious gold, the dark red can begin to fade. And the glorious gold of his presence and his love can begin to come in. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. If you see Jesus, if he really truly comes to you, it creates a gladness in you. A gladness. I really want you to know Jesus. I just really want you to know Jesus. Um, There's things you can do to get to know him. There's things you can do to get to know Jesus. And if you do those things, it's easier to spot him when he shows up. So we just really want to encourage you to pursue intimacy with Jesus. It doesn't just stop there. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And he breathed on them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you will hold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Did you notice Jesus doubles down on the gift of peace? He says it earlier in the passage, peace be with you. And then he says it again, peace be with you. Do you know what Jesus does? As he comes to you and he says, he wants to give you peace. But for the church to be the church, he then wants to give you way more peace than you could ever need, so you've got enough to give away to the world. For me, one of the biggest things that shifted in the last few months as I've been really trying to think and pray through contending for spiritual awakening is, I used to come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, would you meet me here? Would you, meet, you know, would you, I'm sad or I'm uh, needing this or this is what I want. And I would, when I get for him what I need, I would say, thank you, Jesus, that's great. And I'd go back and carry on doing what I was doing. But what Jesus does is he says, here's what you need. Now let me give you loads more peace more peace so that every person you come and bump into today, every person you interact with today, will receive from you the excess peace that I've given you and you can give it to them. Does that make sense? And he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he sends them through the locked door. There is a t- he's like, now you guys need to unlock that door and go out there with this excess peace, and minister it to the people that you bump into. And we have to get this. If we're going to see a spiritual awakening, if we're going to see uh, the, the work of God in, in our town, if we want to see our families and our businesses and our communities transformed, we have to get this, that there is a moment where Jesus says to you, receive peace for yourself, receive more on top of what you need, And then, there's a locked door, now go out through the locked door. Go and do what I did. Now, again, this is something I'm learning. I used to feel like, maybe I I just grew up playing too many video games. But you know like when there's a battle or something in a video game, and you switch the computer on, and you play the video game, it's like a fight or whatever. Maybe you don't know, but yeah, yeah, you you have the fight. And then when you're done, you just switch it off. And you go back to normal life. And, and I had the idea that when you were contesting for something with God, like there would just be this short period of time where you have a little battle and have a little fight and then you're done and then you just go back to normal life. But the reality is that we're in a war that is a real war. And when we contend, we contend for weeks, months, years and decades against a great enemy in, in, in the midst of a great battle. 
So it changes your perspective, I think. If you think that, oh, I just, all I need to do is just pray for healing, just what, you know, a couple of times, oh, it didn't work, maybe God doesn't want to do it. Oh, I want to pray that my friend becomes a Christian. Oh, well, I've tried that for a few weeks and nothing came of it. Oh, I want to, I want to pray that, um, that God would begin to shift things in Turkey or whatever, you know, like in this situation here. I, I, it's on the news, so I'll pray for it for a, a week and then, oh, forget it. Like, we're, we're in a war, right? We're in a war, which means that you, you get up and you don't get to choose when the war ends. And you don't really get to choose how the battle is. You just go to fight and contend. And you keep doing it as long as it's necessary. And that Jesus is sending us to be those people. We contend for the spiritual awakening of those around us. Jesus says this, uh, If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you withhold, it's withheld. Oh, let's jump on. Jump, jump, jump. Oh, go back one. Am I right? Oh, no, this is right. You're quite right. You're ahead of me. You're doing well. So this is what happens when we, do what, when we do this. When we go through the locked door, when we as the church say, I'm going to go and contend, I'm going to fight, the world begins around us, the families, the communities around us begin to look more like the future heavenly realm, the, the kingdom come, than if we weren't doing it. Like, we can be used by Jesus to see real change in people and in, and in the world. Do you believe that? Like, Jesus says, this is like the king, the guy who's already proven the strategy. Jesus has already proven this strategy works. And he says, off you go. Use this strategy that I've proven works, and you'll see change. You'll see transformation. Okay. So what do we do? Uh, Jesus says this, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So I don't know if you've ever looked up, oh, what, how did the Father send Jesus? And uh, we're in small groups, we're going to look at all the verses in John where Jesus says, I've been sent to, the, to do this. This is what the Father sent me to do. It's really interesting if you do that. I'll give you a, uh, a few here. So the first thing that Jesus says is when you're sent... He says this over and over again, you don't speak your own words, you speak the words of the one who sent you. That's so important. When you're sent, we're sent to contend by speaking God's word. This is what Jesus himself says, the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own, it comes from the one who sent me. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. I did, and for I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. So if you're wanting to be sent to contend, you begin to say, I'm not just going to, it's not like, oh, I just have to be honest. Let me just be really honest in this moment. It's like, let's find the words that the Lord has given me to say, and I try and say these as much as possible. So what you do is you find time in the book where you're like, Jesus, how would I say this? What would you have me say to my work colleagues? How would I express this to my family? How would I say this to this person who I'm really hoping comes to know you? And it's time in the book. What is it you want me to say? Now, just to be really clear, in the book, there's a lot of stuff about, oh, God, where are you? Why are you so far off? Or I'm really struggling or I'm really stressed. It's not that you deny emotions. But you just find his words. And that's part of the call of what it is. Sit with the book and like, Jesus, I'm going into work tomorrow. Would you help me work out what would you say? What would you have me say to my colleagues, to my employees, to my employers? I, uh, I found that with um, a lot of people, I bump into a lot of people and we'd have a chat, this, that, and the other. And then we'd do a debrief afterwards with, with Leslie. And Leslie would be like, oh, how they're doing? And, you know, what's going on with their life? And this, that, and the other. And I'd be like, yeah, I think they're all right. And, um, and then I'd find that I'd turn around and then she'd be speaking to them on the next occasion. And they'd be like sobbing. And they'd be like expressing all the... And I'd be like, what, what are you saying to these people? Like, what, what are you doing? When I talk, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, 
nice cup of coffee, isn't it? Yeah, nice cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. yeah like, and it's, but when you talk, it's like the deep things, the shame that they've carried for their life has been lifted off them. Like, it's like, you know, the, the greatest hopes have been unlocked and they're walking into what God has for them. Like, what are you saying to these people? He's like, I just asked them the questions I think Jesus would ask them. See, what, what, speaking these words of God is sometimes just asking the right questions. But we go to try and do it, right? We go to speak the words. Secondly, we use mercy to fight for people to live in forgiveness. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it's withheld. I love this. This is what Jesus, how he first describes how he's been sent. I was not sent to condemn the world, but to save the world. You know, when you're speaking to somebody and they tell you something they've done that you know the Lord would not like, you don't condemn. You may not even say, hey, look, that, that's not right. We, we have an instinct towards mercy, which is, let me find a way to connect you with Jesus' hopes and dreams for your life. Does that make sense? All these the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I'll never drive away. I've come down from heaven not to do my will. Here it is again, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. When you know you're sent, and you know Jesus has asked you to help others be with him forever in eternity, the instinct you have is to fight for them. You fight for them. Who are you fighting for? Just have a think right now. What's the name of two or three or four people you're like, I'm fighting for these people that they will, they will live forever with Jesus. They'll be live in forgiveness with him. Who are they? Three, four, five people, maybe more? You're like, I, I'm going to pay a price that they will live forever with Jesus. I'm fighting for these people. What we've been trying to encourage you to do in small groups is just have two or three people who don't yet know Jesus and you're like, I'm just going to pray for them regularly. You can fight really well in prayer. But some of these people may just be the most obvious people, and you think, am I really fighting for them? Maybe they live with you. Maybe they're your kids. Maybe they're a nephew or a niece. Maybe they're your parents. Maybe you're married to them. Maybe they're a colleague at work. Maybe they are somebody who you actually really don't very much like. But you know Jesus has asked you to fight for them. You, never to drive them away. Never to condemn but instead to seek to say, to release forgiveness. And, to, and, and to, by that he means release them into the forgiveness of God forgiving them, Jesus forgiving them. So I have a sense that there's some prodigals that some of us are fighting for and some people who are just super obvious. Just to fight for in prayer. Um, and, you know, fighting for people is actually quite a lot of fun. It is actually quite a lot of fun. Um, I, I know that one of the favorite things that Leslie does is she loves making food for people or sending them little messages. And that is fine for people. She loves it. And this last uh, week, with all the stuff that's been going on with Jared, um, we've had so many of you fighting for us. Like We have received... So many messages of, hey, I hope you're doing okay. Can I pray for you? We've had people drop around food. We've had people do so many things. Like, when people fight for you, it is amazing. And my dream and my prayer is that every single one of you could experience what we've experienced this last week. Because it's like, I mean, sometimes you're like, another one. Like another person's, oh, how are you doing? Because it's, just, it's so overwhelming. You're like, I can't believe all these people are taking time to message me or to say, to say how are you. And it's so incredible. that you just, It's just like a, the tide coming in of the wave of the mercy of God. And I want you to have that. And I want everyone in Croydon to have that. Don't you? They just they wake up in the morning and there's somebody who says, I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you. What can I, you know, is there anything I can do to help you? And Jesus says to us, we are those who set this as a culture. 
We are the ones who do that for one another. And as we do that for one another, begin to do that for others. We set a culture of fighting for people. So in Lent, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to contend for spiritual awakening. We're going to name people and say, God, would you come on? Like, we want to fight for these people. And finally, we demonstrate the miraculous reality of God. Uh, Jesus said, the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works I'm doing testify that the Father has sent me. So Jesus says, the Father sent me and he gave me some miraculous works to do to prove that he sent me. And then Jesus says, I'm sending you in exactly the same way as the Father sent me. So therefore, I'm going to give you some miraculous works to do that will prove that I, Jesus, have sent you. And you turn around and say, I don't know if I can do that, Jesus. And he's like, that's the whole point. Because if you could do it, it wouldn't prove anything that you'd been sent. But because you cannot do it, I'm going to prove that I sent you by you doing these things that are miraculous works. And I just, I want us to continue to fight for this. I want us to continue to fight for prayers of healing and miracles and signs and wonders and incredible things happening. Because when we do that, people are like, oh, that proves that it can't have been them. Somebody must have sent them. It's Jesus who sent them.